Thank you for listening to the Mutual Audio Network. Please don't turn that dial. The following audio drama is rated R and is recommended restricted for anyone under the age of 17. Hello, I'm Matthew McLean of Yap Audio Production, and I'd like to congratulate Jack and David for the Sonic Society's 10 year milestone. Keep up the good work, guys. Bring the two Davids in! Actually, we are just one. Well, temporarily speaking, we are two. I'm just the one from this time frame, and you're... Both reactor waste in short order! (laughs) If you do not destroy them, then you're a fool, Vidrex. You would do well to watch your tone! Another me? Another us? Yes, but not the same. Clone? Of course, clone! It was a simple matter to take DNA from our last encounter and manufacture our own David Alt. A David Alternative, if you will. He is not the first, but he is the latest in clones. We began looking for a way to destroy you. We discovered enlisting your talents would serve the Vidrex Syndicate. There's got to be a law against that. Agreed. Hey, you, big-headed man on the body of a snow cone machine. I'm not judging, I'm sure you have a beautiful body for an appliance, but it's rather against the rules, even Queensbury rules when you think of it. To steal someone's DNA, it's rather... rather... Well, it's intimate. Yeah, it is that, but that's not what I was going for. Unsavory? Bingo. That's the ticket. That's the word. Unsavoury. It's absolutely and rather much unsavoury for you to be doing that. How ball, even. Ball's knocked all over the dugout. Can we kill them now, please? So, but the plan requires a Time Lord. And while you were made for this moment, having two Time Lords in spare makes for a more assured victory. And another Tordis. Well, this is a bit of a pickle. Yes. And I'm late to this party. How long do we have? According to the tortoise's coordinates before I left, we've entered the No Sleep podcast realm. A place that hovers between audio drama and audio fiction. Perhaps whatever they wish to do begins here, with David Cummings. I quite like that. The incident at the Wilson family ranch has become controversial in the circles of cryptozoologists and conspiracy theorists. Some say the entire thing was a hoax invented by the local police department to stop the East Texas sheriffs from taking over. Others claim the 911 tapes are proof that mankind still has mysteries to solve in our own backyard. Whether a believer on one side or the other, the story has developed a cult following in several conspiracy circles. Now, presented for your decision-making, the 911 recordings of the Wilson Ranch incident. Nine one one, what's your emergency? Um, hi. We have this guy who's been like, walking around the house for a while now, and we're getting kind of nervous. Okay, ma'am. Are your doors and windows locked? Yeah. Yeah, we did that first. We're just kind of freaked out right now. I'm at my boyfriend's house. It's him and his sister here, and this guy's just walking around. Jesus, he's still fucking out there. Can you see him? Yeah, he's just standing right there looking at us. Ma'am, can you describe this person? Um, tall. Like, really big. He's over six foot. Really dark guy. 
The man is African American? No, he's like really dark. Like he's wearing all black. We have floodlights on and he's right at the edge of the light just standing there. Has he moved? No, he's just standing right there. Has the man made any kind of threatening advances? He was circling the house earlier. Then he just went to the front and stayed still. Now he's just there facing the house. I think he's facing the house. Can't really see much. Okay, ma'am. I'm sending an officer right now. Make sure everyone stays calm and keep your windows and doors locked. Holy shit. What? He just ran like fucking jetted. Can you still see him? Hey, Mark, can you still see him? No, he, he just disappeared. He says he can't see the guy. Okay. Officer Jefferson, we have a code 54 at... Please respond. Uh, 10 4 dispatch. I'm, uh, about five miles out. Fuck. What? He just ran past the window. Shit. Mark, get the Mossberg. Ma'am? My boyfriend's on his way to grab the shotgun. Ma'am, the officer is on the way. If this guy breaks in... Ma'am, if your life or the lives of your friends are threatened, take whatever steps needed to defend yourself. Mark. Mark? I got it. Ma'am, the officer is a few miles away. Okay, uh, Mark, you got the... Okay, uh, sorry. My boyfriend has a shotgun. It's a 12-gauge, and I have a 38... Okay, make sure you stay calm. Do not fire on the individual unless need be. The officer is five miles out, and if you want, I can ask him to come in with the lights and sirens. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. The driveway is clear. See that thing? Stacy, take the phone. Take the phone. Ma'am? Stacy, stay. Just take the phone and hide somewhere. I don't care. Just keep taking just Keep talking to the operator. Go, go. H hello? Hello? Is this the sister? Y y yeah, yeah. My name is Stacy Wilson. That thing was on our back porch and Mark just shot him. Stacy? Stacy? Jesus! Shoot it! Shoot it! What? Ah! Mark! Stacy, run! Ma'am? Ma'am? Officer Jefferson, code one. I repeat, code one. Ten four. Residents are Mark and Stacy Wilson. There is also an unidentified female who says she's the girlfriend. Understood. Pulling up to the house now. This is Officer Frank Jefferson, responding to the Code 54 at the Wilson property. Please respond. We lost contact with the original caller a few minutes ago. It sounded like they were attacked. 10-4. Uh, please be advised, there's no one present at the scene. I'm going to go and try and make contact. Police! Dispatch, I'm looking in and it looks like the back glass door has been broken. Can't see much else. I'm going to go in into the house. Be advised, the occupants were armed. Understood. Police, I'm coming in. Don't shoot. Hello, Mr. Wilson? Is there anyone here? Hello? Jesus, what? Oh, dear. Oh, my Jesus. Fuck. Uh, we have a body, a uh, male, late 20s. He, uh, 
Christ, badly mutilated. Our arms have been rem removed. He's been, uh, he's been torn to shreds, dispatch. Requesting backup, EMT, and put in a call to the sheriff's office. We're gonna need detectives on this one. Okay. Officer Davis, please respond. Dispatch, go ahead. Backup requested at code 54, now a code 48. Proceed with caution, officer. Suspect may still be on the scene. 10-4, dispatch. Officer Jefferson, backup is on the way. I've never seen anything like it, dispatch. It's just... It's goddamn horrifying. Police! Freeze! Oh, thank God. We have to get out of here. Stacy Wilson? Mary, I called you guys. We have to get Stacy and go. We have to go right now. Hold on, ma'am. Dispatch 1025, original caller. Please advise. Escort civilians to safety and await backup. 10-4. Mary? Mary, I need you to come with me. We have to find Stacy first. We will. We have backup on the... Ah! Dispatch! Suspect is still here! Officer, we need you to... Mary! Ah! Dispatch! I need backup! I fucking need backup right now, damn it! Jesus. All units converge on... We are 63. I repeat, 63. Officer in distress. Suspect is still on site and suspected armed. 10-0. All available units. 10-4. Dispatch, I'm en route. ETA eight minutes. Understood. Dispatch, I am en route to the address, and there is a young Caucasian female running down the road who appears to be in distress. 10-4, Officer Davis. Please try to ascertain the identity of the female. Stacy Wilson. It killed Mark. It's still there with Mary. You you have to do something. Miss, are you Stacy Wilson? Yes, yes, yes. Now you have to help them. Miss Wilson, my name is Officer Davis. I'm with the police department. I'm gonna get you some help. No, no, no. We have to go back to the ranch. Ma'am, I need you to come with me. Other officers are on their way to the farmhouse. Our number one priority is getting you to safety. No, we have to go back. Dispatch, 1025, Stacy Wilson. Requesting medical personnel to meet me five miles down for assistance. 10-4, medical personnel en route. ETA, six minutes. Stacy, I need you to get in the car. An ambulance is on its way. You can't leave me alone when that thing is out there. I'm not going anywhere, Stacy. I'm going to wait right here with you until the ambulance shows up. Dispatch, what's the ETA on backup? ETA three minutes. Officer Connors and Cobry are en route. 10-4. Miss Wilson is saying the thing is still there. You may want to get eyes in the sky in case the suspect decides to run. Putting a call into the sheriff's office now.
Sheriff's Department. This is Sheriff Tyler Reeve. How may I help you? Sheriff, this is Jessica Reynolds over at the dispatch center. Confirmation number. Authority number. We have a situation at the Wilson property. Address and coordinates. You have your helicopter airborne? Yes, we do. Currently working observation. We have a code 63 with the suspect as a possible flight risk. Can you redirect the helicopter over to the Wilson property? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll patch you through, dispatch. Thank you, Sheriff. Also, any kind of backup would be greatly appreciated. Will do. Thank you. Officer Davis, we have a helicopter inbound. Please stand by. 10-4. Miss Wilson, an ambulance is on its way. Are you hurt in any way? <laughs> that thing ripped my fucking brother apart. The hell you mean? Stacy, are you hurt? I cut my feet on some glass when I ran out of there. Okay. With your consent, I'd like to administer first aid. Is that okay with you? <sighs> yeah. Okay then, Stacy. Stacy, what can you tell me about the suspect that attacked you guys? It was fucking huge. It had to bend down to get into the house. Mark shot it with the shotgun and it did nothing. 12 gauge, point blank, and he might as well have had a BB gun. Okay, okay, Stacy. Everything is gonna be all right. Dispatch, please advise the backup that Mr. Wilson fired at the suspect and apparently it did nothing. Suspect may have body armor and or be on some kind of amphetamine. We'll advise. It wasn't a suspect. It was a thing. Stacy, you just experienced a traumatic event. It's understandable. If Suspects you think aren't covered in scales. What was that? Black scales, like a snake. But it was a guy. Dispatch, the witness is describing the suspect as a scaly looking. Oh. 10-4. No matter what it is, we have two officers on their way. Everything's gonna be okay, Stacy. This is Sheriff Jennifer Dent. I'm coming in fast and we'll be within view of the Wilson property in nine minutes. Backup sheriffs are 20 minutes away. 10-4. Driving on the scene, please advise. Witness is with Officer Davis. Said the suspect is very tall and more than likely wearing some kind of body armor. Eye in the sky will be within sight in nine minutes. Suspect has also been described as looking like they were covered in dark metal plates. 10 4, going for backup weapon. 10 4, Officer Cobry, also be advised. Roger. Pulling in now and going for the backup. 10-4. Police! Jesus Christ! Dispatch! Code... Code 48. It's, uh... It's Frank. Along with the mid-twenties Caucasian female and male. They've all been torn apart. Fucking Christ. Dispatch, the ambulance is pulling in now. Officer Davis, get Miss Wilson into the ambulance and provide escort to the nearest hospital. Dispatch, the way Miss Wilson is describing the suspect, it might be better if I head to the ranch. Negative, Officer Davis. Priority one is to get civilians to safety. Understood, dispatch. 
Come on, Stacy. We gotta go. You're coming to the hospital with me? Yes, I am. There are already two officers on the scene. Did they find Mary? Um, short, brown hair, ears pierced, really pretty? I'll ask. Officers Connors and Cobry, is there a female on the scene? Goes by Mary. Short brown hair, pierced ears. I'm sorry, officer, but that sounds like our Caucasian female. Ten four. What the hell was that? Dispatch, we have movement. Something's out here. Dispatch, I'm hearing gunfire. Please advise. Over. Officer Davis, after Miss Wilson is in the... Send backup! Now! We are code 63. Officers in need of assistance. I'm on my way. Medic, get her out of here. Officer Davis, your priority is the civilian. Negative dispatch. It's moving too fast. I can't get a beat on it. to get behind us. Oh, shit. I just saw him over there. There's more than one. I repeat, there is more than one. Five, six, I'm counting at least six. Holy shit! Kevin! Dispatch! We have large... Uh, somethings! Not human! Over seven feet! At, at least six of them! Officer Connors is... Sheriff Dent, please tell me you have visual on the suspects. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Jesus Christ. Dispatch, these have to be some kind of animals. Or in... in pursuit. Wounded suspect is stopped approximately three miles west of the Wilson property. He seems to be... Holy shit! Shit! He just threw something into my spotlight! Do you have eyes on the suspect? Negative. Turning on the thermal camera. Suspects are... Suspects are gone! 
Dispatch. Say again? Suspects are gone. They're not showing up on the thermal. Suspects are lost. I repeat, suspects are lost. I'm, I'm getting hit with something throwing pebbles against the windows of the helicopter. Shit, I just had a rock crack the glass in my cockpit. I'm sorry, dispatch, I've got to get out of here. Ten four, Sheriff. Pull back. I'm sorry, dispatch. Just get to safety, Sheriff. Ten four. I'm going on break. The 911 calls were never released to the public for two different reasons. To those who believe them to be hoaxes, the tapes are nothing more than fear-mongering. To the people who believe them to be genuine, they feature the violent deaths of five people. The 911 tapes were released anonymously after the local PD was dissolved and integrated into the Sheriff's Department. After their release, newly minted Sheriff's Department Commander Reeve released a statement calling them a, quote, sick joke, end quote. The deaths were ruled the result of an animal attack, and no further investigation was launched into the incident. Officer Cobry put in his two weeks' notice shortly after it was announced the Sheriff's Department was taking over the county. I know what I saw, and it wasn't some big teenagers on bath salts. After recovering from a concussion and the several scrapes, gashes, and broken bones that he received after going into the windshield of his police cruiser, Officer Cobry joined a local police department in upstate New York where he had a family. When asked about the incident, he is very open and honest. If it didn't happen, then why did three of my closest friends get ripped apart? Why were the bodies there? You think a mini tornado came down or something? Coyotes suddenly grew six feet taller? Three of my closest friends are dead, and I will not soil their memory by spouting some toe-the-line crap from Hillbilly in charge. When asked why he believes the transcript was so openly mocked by the authorities, he responded sarcastically. Hey, come to East Texas. Get ripped apart by a seven-foot thing. Maybe his buddies will even join. See? Don't mess with Texas has a much nicer ring as far as tourism slogans go. Officer Cobry's testimony has also been mocked by several members of the local sheriff's department. Since his transfer to upstate New York, he has had several reprimands written against him due to drinking on the job. He was eventually forced to do a stint in rehab before finally being assigned to desk duty. Stacy Wilson responds to questions in a much different way. After the incident, she voluntarily entered a mental institution following a complete mental breakdown. She was arrested on charges of mayhem, vandalism, and destruction of property after destroying a bookstore. Witnesses said she was calmly browsing when she began hyperventilating. Then she jumped up and began tearing apart several different books while screaming obscenities. She still has yet to comment on what made her snap. After being released from the institution, she became a born-again Christian. 
She left East Texas and moved to Utah where she now lives and works various odd jobs, never holding down the same job for more than a few months. When asked for a comment on what happened, she simply said, That was the devil and his minions. They are here for the end times. Now, please don't call me again. Sheriff Dent, the helicopter pilot, was terminated after the incident. She claimed until the day she was let go that she had no choice but to retreat since she was flying blind and under attack by an unknown enemy. The sheriff's department would not comment on what led to her termination, supposedly out of fear it would give the tapes credibility, only to state that she, quote, did not behave in a way expected of a Texas sheriff, end quote. Since her termination, former Sheriff Dent went off the grid. The next two years of her life are still a mystery. She only popped up again when she was found dead in a trailer in southeastern Oklahoma. Although many claim murder, an autopsy later revealed she died after untreated injuries with several cuts on her arms and legs becoming infected. How or why she got the cuts is still debated. The unsung hero of the incident was the phone operator, Jessica Reynolds. After the incident, she worked at the dispatch center for another year. Sheriff Reeve even gave her an Employee of the Month award for outstanding professionalism and never missing a shift. Her co-workers and friends said she became more and more distant as time went on. When asked about what happened that night, she would become quiet or change the subject. In the later months, she would simply leave the room or look at the floor, sitting speechless until she was left alone. Nine months after the incident, a memorial for the fallen officers was built outside the sheriff's office. For the next few days, Jessica would drive to the building during her lunch break and eat at the base of the statue. Then, on a Thursday afternoon, a year after the incident took place, she took a half day off. She drove home, sat out on the balcony of her apartment, and committed suicide with a single gunshot wound to the head. She left no note other than a text message to Officer Cobry. Quote, I'm sorry, Thomas. Jess. End quote. She was 25 years old. These tapes are still up for debate as to whether or not they are real. Many believe they were simply the last-ditch effort of keeping local police local. Conspiracy theorist going by the name NWO Fallout, a major proponent of the tapes are real theory, agreed to make a statement as long as his username was used. What's really terrifying about the whole thing isn't just that there's more than one of these creatures, or even the creatures themselves. It's how they acted. They stayed outside the light, they attacked one at a time only at opportune moments, they successfully evaded capture. This wasn't a mindless animal attack. The creatures were gauging the police reaction, they were probing for weaknesses. Debate still rages as to a definite description of the creatures. All that is known is the statements made after the incident by the surviving witnesses. Over seven feet tall, dark, scaly skin, bipedal, bone-white claws that were between two and four inches long, and immense strength. With the report of scales and the failure to see the creatures on thermal imaging, the widely supported theory is they are reptilian. Whether or not the creatures exist is still up for debate. The only known evidence for them other than the tapes are the occasional body found in a similar state as the ones described at the Wilson Ranch. The final word goes to Officer Cobry. There were six of them that we know of. They took out a helicopter, five people, of which four were armed, and still got away. If there's more of them somewhere out there, I think us, like us as a species, are fucked. We just got knocked down a notch in the food chain. Stay the hell out of East Texas, and hopefully they'll let be. 
Now, if you'll excuse me, I just got a call I gotta respond to. to go soon. But before I do, I want to tell you all about my cowboy. The man who took me into the forever night. The man who made me hungry and then left me to starve. Listen close. I want to tell you about the man I love. I was a preacher's daughter. Daddy thundered fire and brimstone from the pulpit on Sundays. Repent or be damned and hillbillies would shout and quiver. At night, he'd pull down my jammies and sweat over me, whispering the word of God in my ear. He'd take the belt to me after. Temptation is a sin, child. Honey like yours will lead the righteous astray. Mama was soft and kind, with slate gray eyes and a voice like a sparrow song. Her makeup was caked thick to hide the purple on her cheekbones. Let's run away, I said. Run as far as we can and be free. She pet my head and dried my tears and told me, Ain't nowhere to run, baby. It's the same all over. This is the way life is. Be a good girl and we'll find our reward in the other place. I didn't like it when Daddy spat hellfire, but I liked to hear Mama talk about the other place. In my dreams, it was orange and pink. A desert sunrise in my heart was the sky... In my dreams, I was free. I ran one night, past brush and prairie dog holes with Daddy's voice on the chase. You get back here, devil girl, or I'll whip you silly. But I was fast and small and hard to find in the dark. I crouched low behind an old mesquite, teardrops making polka dots in the silver sand. I clasped my hands and I whispered a prayer. Please, if you're out there, help me. Show me the way out. I heard something. Wet chewing and slurping, and something scraping the ground. The sound of a hunter picking meat off his kill. I followed the sound and found a circle of rocks, like a heathen church. Something in the middle bobbing up and down. Something else twitching and moaning. I hugged close to a big rock and peeked my head around the side. I saw a man. A skinny cowboy in faded denim and snakeskin boots. His skin so pale it looked like blue jelly. He crouched and licked at the neck of another shaking on the ground. The other's eyes were wide and rolling, his mouth sucking air like a fish on the shore. The cowboy's head shot up and he sniffed the air. Rusty red oozed down his mouth, slow as molasses. His head jerked around, and his eyes found mine. Black eyes, vulture eyes, eyes that held the night itself. Eyes that could wrap you up and squeeze you soft or tight. He smirked, and the stringy pieces of red jiggled as he talked. Ain't your mama ever teach you not to stare? I know what you are. Bloodsucker, right? I've seen the movies. Get your head out the clouds, girl. Me and my buddy are just having a talk. Make me like you, I said. Cowboy laughed. (laughs) You want to be like me? Sucking on dead meat in the dark like a mangy old dog? I am a dog. A dog with its leg in a trap, and I want you to chew it off. My mama says this is just how it is, but I'm going to run and run and look for somewheres different. Your mama's a smart woman. Who you want to kill? 
Ain't no one want to be like me lest they got someone to kill. My daddy. Ah, it's always the daddies. Listen up, girl. This life ain't no fairy tale. It's a death rattle before every meal. It's railroad spike hunger. So heavy you can't think of nothing else. It's a forever night with no more sunrises. No more till the last one. The one that light you up like the 4th of July. I told you, I seen the movies. Oh yeah, then you seen the endings. It's a bad luck life, and you'd be stupid to pick it. I stepped out from behind the rock and stared hard into those marble eyes. Pulled my dress up over my head. Naked and shaken, I walked toward him. I brushed my hair from my neck and said I might be stupid, but I know what I want. Sink your teeth into me, cowboy. Find the red life inside me and make it your own. He stood up and circled me, his frozen eyes chilling me wherever they looked. Dummy, you want to run from the sun? I won't tell you no. Get ready. It hurts. He pulled me close, snuffed at my neck. Cold nose and cold breath. My heart pumping like it was out of time. His mouth open and he breathed blue frost. Locked jaw bites sunk into my flesh and razor wire scraped my veins. My skin screamed and my insides swelled thick with tar. I dropped down into the dirt. Takes a minute to get used to it. Don't go. Sorry, honey. I ramble solo. Eat soon or it'll make you crazy. Good luck. And he was gone. The world was gone. I was falling or floating in cavernous dark. Nothing above or below. Heavy footsteps pulled me back from eternity. I opened my mouth and gurgled. Come back to me, cowboy. Come back. Daddy looked down at me and cracked his rusty knuckles. I think it's high time I taught you something about humility. Iron hands dragged me back to the yard and lifted me onto the splintery workbench. Oh, I'm a patient man, child. Oh, but we can't have you running off like that no more. He lifted the crowbar and set it down gently to kiss my kneecap. His eyes were ablaze with white fire. The word of the Lord shall light the holy path. He said, raising the crowbar high. And the wicked shall cower under the sword of judgment. A cackle from the shadows. <laughs> Preacher man, huh? I ain't never had much use for the word. Daddy spun round. Who, uh, who in the hell's that? I'm the sin you ain't got the balls to commit. Cowboy stepped forward, the moon making a halo round his oil spill hair. Let her alone. <laughs> Who's gonna make me? Skinny boy like you? Huh. Come here, son, and I'll put the fear of God into you. Daddy swung the crowbar, and Cowboy caught it. Daddy's arm snapped, and milky wet bone popped through the skin. He fell, screaming. Cowboy drove the crowbar deep into his gut. Fence post pinning him to the ground. Skinny boys are hard to kill, old man. And I'm as skinny as they come. Go ahead, girl. You must be feeling it by now. I was. My belly hissed and clawed like a raccoon in a cage. 
I rolled off the table and crawled on all fours. Daddy squealing and shouting, but the sound was distant and small. I heard one thing and one thing only. The warm heartbeat calling me with its low rhythm. I clamped my teeth hard into his neck. Red juice spurted and dribbled down my chin like a ripe tangerine. It pumped into my mouth and filled me until I shuddered and sighed. Daddy was sheet white and stammering. Please! Please! I ran sticky red hands through his hair. Shh, Daddy. It's okay. I'm gonna teach you something about humility, I said. I stuck my fingers into the hole in his neck and pulled until the meat split apart. I threw his head into the brush and sucked his jugular dry like milkshake straw. I looked up with my belly filled with the soul of another. I could see colors I didn't have names for. I heard crickets landing on blades of grass and smelled the powder on the wings of moths. I felt the neon night for the first time. I looked at my cowboy. A blue denim dream with see-through skin. I looked at him and I knew I'd follow him to the end. You never forget your first. I showed him a red smile that dropped when I heard the screams. Mama was in the yard, yelling, Charles, Charles, and staring at Daddy's big blue hands. She looked at me. Monster, she yelled through snotty sobs. No, Mama, wait. But Cowboy's hand held my shoulder. She's right. You ain't got no mama now. Our kind don't make friends with the food. Run, girl, and find the place you're looking for. I'm coming with you. The hell you are. I got enough shit to shovel without babysitting, too. I didn't ask no questions. The world was small before I met you. Now it's big enough to swallow me up. I want to see it all with someone who knows how. Where you ramble, I ramble as long as it takes. Cowboy shook his head. Oh, God damn, girl. You're like a toothache that won't go away. Well, if you're coming, then come. Sun's hot on our heels, and if we don't keep moving, he's going to catch us in the open. I stuck close to his side, and we ran. When the sun went down, we'd stalk the hills, hunting for bony ranch hands and oily teenagers. My ears were sharper than his, and I could hear the river rush in their veins a mile off. I'd wrap myself in a velvet shadow and wait for my meal to walk by. He taught me how to hit them with a kill strike to make it quick, how to crush their windpipe so they wouldn't scream, how to make it look like a cougar attack. Every meal was a sticky poem, sweet as candy when I looked between my fingers. During the day, we'd lay low in a cave or an old trailer, and he'd tell me stories as I floated into dreams. He called me his toothache. He didn't talk much about his life before the bite. There'd been a wife and a daughter, but they were long gone. I asked what happened to them once, and his dark eyes looked away. You never, never forget your first, he said, and I didn't ask again. One night, we found a couple of hikers wrapped up in their sleeping bags. His didn't even wake up, but mine was feisty. She was fighting and flailing and flopping slowly as I sucked out the juice. Finally, she just held my back and breathed slow. I looked in her half-closed eyes. She knew it was all right, and the end wasn't really so scary. I kissed her soft and left a red stain on her lips. Just relax, hon. Relax and let go. You're going to the other place, I said. Her eyes went cloudy, 
and she drifted away. Cowboy scoffed. Other place? Grow up, toothache. Ain't no place but here. You're a grumpy old dog sometimes. How do you know what comes after? I've been on the hunt long enough to know that the only difference between live meat and dead meat is a few twitches and grunts. Think what you want. I've seen the other place in my dreams and we're going there when it's over. He laughed. <laughs> uh, Sunday school was a long time ago, kid. If there is another place, you and I ain't gonna see it. We're burning for what we done. Eating ain't a sin. We're gonna be free and happy and you'll thank me when we get there. Kid. He said with narrow eyes. If you can point to one thing. One real goddamn thing that'll show me there's something else in the sky. I will drop to my knees and sing hallelujah right here. I was quiet for a bit. I prayed that night, I said. I prayed for a way out. And there you were. Make fun all you want, but I see the other place when I look at you. Maybe I ain't got no proof, but I got a hope. I hope there's orange and gold at the end of this night. A place where all hurts are soothed and bright light fills us until we are the sun. And I hope we go together, you and me, together with no end. Why in the hell do you want that? Because I... Because I... And I was going to say the word, but he gave me a look that stopped me cold. I held the word in my mind instead so he could read it behind my eyes. We made camp in an old bear den just before the watercolor dawn. He held me close, closer than he ever had. No stories that day, just his arm on my waist and his breath in my hair. You've got a sunrise in your heart, he said as I closed my eyes. I woke at dusk and reached out for him. I found a note been fun, Toothache, but the lonely road is calling. Don't bother looking for me. If this life teach you one thing, it's how to stay hid. Adios. I was shaken. So Mom was right. This is the way life is. I ran into the rocky hills found some city folk roughing it in an RV and I tore them to chunks. The red spilled into the sand and I didn't drink a drop. I could smell him in their veins. It's been days. He told me the hunger would make me crazy, but I don't feel a thing. There's another hunger eating away at me, turning me to dust from inside out. The note was a lie, too. He said he rambles solo, but that ain't the truth. The truth was in his eyes that night when I almost said the word. Cowboy didn't fear nothing except that word. He was afraid I'd try to say it again and he wouldn't be able to stop me. He was afraid I'd say it and it'd drop him dead quicker than a stake to the heart. Maybe he was right. I made up my mind. After I set this down, I'm going to take a walk into the cool blue desert. And I'm going to find a nice place to sit and watch. The yellow streaks over the mountains will burn my tears away. And I'll be carried off on rainbow beams like a dream upon waking. If this world is the same all over, maybe it's different in the next. There's a sunrise in my heart. And I'm dying to dig it out. But if my cowboy ever sniffs you out in the dark and spills your neck juice down his chin, tell him something with your last breath, will you? Tell him if there's another place, I'll be waiting there on the day when the sun catches up to him. Tell him if there's not, then my ashes will ride the desert wind and search for him in the night. Tell him real hunger only gets worse the more you feed it, and I've been starving from the moment we met. And if he doesn't give you time for all that, just tell him one thing for me, will you? Tell him I loved him, please.
The Sonic Society Season 10 is written and produced by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music provided by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society through Creative Commons licensing. The Sonic Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Hey everyone, it's Mark from Leap Audio. I'm here to tell you about something really exciting. July 24 through 26 of 2020, Halifax, Nova Scotia, we are gathering together in the world's first international modern audio drama convention and family reunion. Inspired in part by the living, loving memory of our dear friend Bill Hallwake, we're bringing together writers, producers, actors, and our fans for workshops, seminars, and even live performances. So join us, won't you? Go to madcon.com. That's www.mad-con.com for more information. I hope to see you in Halifax in 2020.